In section 1.2, we're going to look at the difference between observational studies and designed experiments. Observational study. Researchers simply gather or record data that already exists in the world. This is often referred to as natural data. And the results can only show an association, not cause and effect. So for example, you might do a survey and ask people what eye color they have. So you're having no effect on their eye color. That data is going to exist whether you ask it or not. They have an eye color. You're just observing what color it is. Another option is a designed experiment. Here the researcher has some control over the subjects being studied. The researcher can make choices on behalf of the subject. The researchers often intentionally change the value of a variable of interest. Result, results can show cause and effect in this type of study. For example, perhaps you're going to be doing a study on whether a certain medical treatment can help a bald person grow back hair. In such a designed experiment, you would probably uh, give some of the participants the actual treatment, but others you would give a placebo, kind of a fake treatment that doesn't really do anything, but still gives them that thought that they're trying to treat their baldness. Let's consider that example as we look through some of the language of a designed experiment. Treatments are the different values for a variable that will be assigned to the subject by the experiment experimenter. So in the example we're discussing, um, one of the treatments would be that the, the person would receive the real medicine for baldness, and another treatment would be that they received no medicine for baldness, or perhaps that they received a fake medicine for baldness. And that's getting at the idea of control, where you want two or more treatment options to be possible for the subjects in the experiment, and a control group where no treatment is given is often one of the options. And a critical element of a designed experiment is randomization. It must be randomly decided which treatment a subject is to receive in the experiment. The subject cannot have been the one to make the choice. So we're going to randomly choose for a participant whether they get the real treatment or the um, fake or placebo treatment. They don't get to choose that for themselves. We also want to make sure that our designed experiments have replication. This refers to the idea that we will conduct the experiment using many subjects. The result from any one subject is hard to use to draw conclusions. However, if a large sample is used, then the patterns that emerge can lead to meaningful conclusions. So if you were to give a baldness treatment to one person and it worked, you don't know if that person was going to just grow hair back by themselves anyways. You don't know if it's the medicine. It's hard to decide what's really causing that. If it doesn't work, you don't know if it's just that person that it didn't work on or if that would be all people. So you want to have a large number of people getting the real treatment and the control so you can see if there's a real pattern there. Additionally, but not always, we like to have blinding in our design experiments. So one type would be a single blind experiment. This means that the subject is not aware, aware of which treatment they are receiving. That would be true in the one we're talking about now where you wouldn't tell the person whether they were getting the placebo uh, medication or the real medication. So they would be blind to that um, aspect. And in double-blind experiments, this is also true of the researchers who interact with the subjects. And what this means is the person who's interviewing the person, maybe who's looking at their hair and interacting with them, um, does not know which treatment they receive, so they're not biased by that. And mainly we're doing all of this work to try and avoid the effects of confounding variables. 
If the variation in an experimental outcome can be realistically caused by more than one variable, then we say we have confounding variables. Randomization and replication can help reduce the effects of confounding variables. And then finally, we'll be looking at some response variable, and this is the variable that might be affected by the variables we are controlling. So, for example, in our baldness study, we'd be looking at a response variable, most likely, of hair growth. We will now look at a couple examples involving observational studies and design experiments. A study of Chabot transcripts revealed that students who take math classes during the evening tend to have significantly higher success rates than those who take similar classes during the day. Would you classify this as an observational study or designed experiment and explain your reasoning? The key here is to look at who is making the choice in the treatment, and the treatments would be whether the student is taking the class during the day or the evening. And in most colleges, and that does include Chabot as well, the student is the one who would make that choice. So I would refer to this one as an observational study. And then my explanation would be that the student chose the time of day. Does this show that a student who had trouble with math during a day during the day would be well advised to switch to evening classes for math? Well, that's possible, but we can't say that cause and effect has been shown here because this is just an observational study. So I would tend to say no on this one and just give as my reason that it's an observational study. Now the success rates are higher at night, but we're not sure what the reason is. It could be because of the time of day itself, but it could be because of some other confounding variables. And that's what we're asked about here in Part C. What are some of the confounding variables that exist in this study? So one of the factors that we might think about is the age of the student. So students who take evening classes tend to be ones who have full-time jobs during the day or maybe have kids in school during the day, and so they tend to be older students. Not always, but that is the overall pattern. Another possibility that could exist could be the work ethic of the student. If the students at night are more likely to have jobs or kids, then they're mo more likely to have already developed uh, a pattern of responsibility and organization that allows them to get their work done in the time that they have allotted. So again, this isn't true for every student, but it does tend to be a pattern that exists between day and night. Let's look at another example. A study conducted on an allergy medication involved 100 patients who were split randomly into two groups. One group received the allergy medication and one group received a placebo. No participant was told which group they were in. The study showed that those taking medication, the medication were significantly more likely to report drowsiness than those taking a placebo rather than the medic medication. Would you classify this as an observational study or a designed experiment? So again, the key is looking at who is making the choice on the treatment. And it says that the patients were split randomly into the two groups. And so that would be the key for me there. So since the patient is not making that choice, but the researcher is, and especially because they're doing it randomly, I would say this is a designed experiment. And the reason I would give is that the subjects were randomly assigned to a treatment.
And once we've decided that we're dealing with a design experiment, now we have lots of other follow-up details that we're going to look at as well. So they start to address those with us in the following questions. So can we conclude that the allergy medication is causing the drowsiness? Well, now that you're doing a design experiment, you have a hope that you can show cause and effect. So I'm going to go ahead and say yes here and give the reason as that it's a designed experiment. In order for cause and effect to be a valid conclusion, it has to be a well-designed experiment. And we are just seeing a brief description of it here. But when we see that it's a design experiment, we're going to go ahead and say yes, because that is at least a possibility now, unlike in an observational study. What are the treatments that are used in this experiment? Well, the two treatments seem to be the allergy medication and the placebo. And then what is the response variable of interest? Well, you would think that if you're giving an allergy medication, the natural response you'd be looking for is, does the medication work? But as you look through the wording of this, this problem seems to be more about side effects than it does about the actual medicine itself. So they were looking to see if people reported drowsiness or not. So I would list that as the response variable of interest. So I'm going to say drowsiness there. And does the study include replication and explain? So again, the idea, we don't want to just give one person the medicine, one person the placebo. We want to do it to, to lots of them. And it does say up at the top there, if we go back here, that there were 100 patients involved in this, not just one or two. So I would say yes to this last question. Now there's always a question of was it enough replication and generally the way you decide that is if the, the problem says that there was a significantly big difference between the two groups then we're going to infer from that that there was enough replication for that difference to stand out as not being random. And then finally would you consider this experiment to involve blinding and I would say yes that it's at least a single blind experiment. And the reason I would give for that is it says no participant was told which group they were in. And we can find that up here in the wording. No participant was told which group they were in. And so that's our clue that it was a blinded experiment. Now it's also possible that this was a double-blind experiment, but we don't have the details in the problem to know that. So if the people interacting with these participants don't know whether they received the medication or the placebo, then I would say it's double-blind. If the people that are interviewing them, handing out the pills, do know, then it would only be single-blind. But those details aren't given. But we can definitely say yes to the question of did it involve blinding because the participant did not know which group they were in.